Okay, so this is the third and final lecture for chapter four, and in this lecture we're just going to round it out with a few uh, small topics here, mutations, post-translational modifications, and then protein degradation, and then a couple clinical pearls at the end for you. All right, so as we've said before, mutations that occur in the DNA sequence have downstream effects because, as you remember here, we have normal DNA, double-stranded, you, then you transcribe an mRNA, so this sequence is transcribed in the mRNA sequence, and then the mRNA sequence, each of these codons, is then translated into the polypeptide sequence. So an effect here can get brought into the mRNA and then eventually can affect the polypeptide sequence. And you see that here. So you, you substitute this adenine here, or this thymine here, then you end up with a uracil instead of an adenine in the mRNA sequence, and then this changes the codon to where instead of a tyrosine, now you have a phenylalanine. And so you've changed the polypeptide sequence, which then can have effect potentially on the protein structure and then even the protein function. So over the next few slides, we're gonna talk about different types of point mutations. So a point mutation is exactly what we've shown you here, is where a single nucleotide gets changed, which then results in a single nucleotide being changed in the mRNA sequence, which then changes the codon sequence which then could potentially change the amino acid sequence. And so the four types we'll go over over the next few slides are silent mutation, missense mutation, nonsense mutation, and frame shift. These four are very high yield for biochemistry exams and for board exams, so you definitely want to take note of all four of these and really know them. So a silent mutation, you have a new codon sequence that results from this point mutation. So let's go over to the figure here. So we have the DNA sequence up here. This is the mRNA that's produced. It says DNA template because it's a template for transcription, mRNA template because this is the template for translation. Same thing just as the mRNA strand, DNA strand. So this is the normal sequence for DNA, normal mRNA sequence. So here, if we substitute a guanine for this adenine here, that's gonna result in a cytosine in the mRNA, which then changes the codon from UUU to UUC. So let's go over to the chart here. Remember our codon chart? So if we look at UUU codes for phenylalanine, like we show here, but then you've changed it to UUC, which also codes for phenylalanine. So there's really no changing the end result. You have the same amino acid, the polypeptide sequence is the same. As a result, the protein structure is the same, and then the protein function is the same. So it's called silent because in the end, it doesn't really matter because you still produce the same polypeptide sequence versus a missense mutation. So before I explain this, I really wanna apologize. There's a few errors in this diagram in the book on this just for the missense. For the rest of the diagram, it's correct. But specifically, this codon sequence here is incorrect. So make sure you correct it to GCA, which is the same here as the normal, and then CGU, and then this is an arginine. We have it marked as a glycine, which is incorrect. We're not trying to show that. This is where the mutation is what we're trying to show. So make sure you make sure you change it to where it's a histidine is the amino acid that results from the, the mutation. And again, we apologize about that. So with a missense mutation, as you can see here, this adenine is substituted for this guanine, which then results in this cytosine here. So now you have a new codon. This was your old codon, UAU, which corresponded to tyrosine. Now you have a new codon, CAU, which corresponds to histidine. So now you've changed the polypeptide sequence. So the end result here is different versus the silent mutation. And so as a result of having a different amino acid, however, it just depends on how it affects the overall protein structure, or the, and then the primary sequence, and then the protein structure, and then the protein function. So depending on what amino acid is put in, and depending on what the rest of the sequence is, it actually could render no effect, or it could cause the protein to be non-functional. And so it just really depends. Then you have a nonsense mutation. So again, a new codon sequence is generated. And here you have an adenine, which is ch exchanged for a thymine, which then results in a adenine here instead of a uracil. So you change the, the codon from UAU to UAAA. And UAAA is actually a stop codon. So now you've not only changed the codon, but you've changed it to a stop codon. So as a result, protein translation just stops right here. You could have 15, 50, 100 codons after this left to read. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. If you have the stop codon here, it's going to stop. So let's say you know, the normal protein would have been this long, and then you stop right here. As you can see, the polypeptide sequence is gonna be much shorter. 
And this obviously can have a significant effect because if you don't have part of the structure, it could definitely have an effect on the function or it could even render it non-functional, which happens in many cases. Lastly, a frame shift mutation. This is arguably the most devastating. This involves inserting or deleting any number of nucleotides that is not divisible by three. So what does that mean? Either you insert, you know, one or two or five or 11 nucleotides. Usually most examples we're going to be talking about one, and that's what we show here. And the reason why it can't be divisible by three, so let's say you took out these three guys here. You still preserve the rest of this sequence. This DNA sequence is the same. This mRNA sequence is the same. And then as a result, this polypeptide is just going to be this one area that's affected. Versus if you insert, you know, for example, here we show where we inserted an adenine between this thymine and this guanine. So this thymine, here's the guanine. As a result, then you get a uracil inserted here between the adenine and cytosine on the mRNA. This shifts the entire DNA sequence this way, one, one nucleotide. It shifts the entire mRNA sequence. And then as a result, you're going to be changing every codon from this point on. And so as a result of changing every codon, you could change all of the amino acids or definitely most of them. And so as you can see here, instead of an arginine, now you have a serine. Instead of a tyrosine, you have a leucine and so on and so on. And so by shifting the entire sequence from this point forward, you're going to be changing the protein structure potentially and then the protein function. And so just some conventions we want to point out. So if you remember, this is the N terminus, which is where the start codon would be. And then you have the C terminus, which is where the stop codon would be. So this is going to affect the sequence in, on the C towards the C terminus of the polypeptide. And this often results in a truncated protein because as you shift all of the mRNA sequence, you're eventually going to create a new stop codon likely. And so it, that's going to be reached before you can even finish this newly shifted sequence. And so that'll result in a truncated protein. And again, several devastating genetic diseases are a result of frame shift mutations, such as Tay-Sachs disease. So again, the take home message here is that you're either inserting or deleting a number of nucleotides not divisible by three, and you really throw off the entire reading frame, which then throws off the entire sequence of the polypeptide, which can have a really drastic effect on the protein or even just creating a non-functional protein or deficient protein. So briefly here, we're going to talk about post-translational modifications, which are sometimes abbreviated as PTM. And it's in the name. These are modifications to proteins that occur after translation. So they're not part of the translation process. And there's two main types. So first you have trimming of the N or C terminal propeptides from zymogens to yield active proteins. So this is really key in pancreatic enzymes. So for example, here we talk about trypsinogen. So this is just a cartoon. This isn't necessarily the exact structure of trypsinogen. So you have trypsinogen and it has this little, the peptide structure or protein structure and it has this little additional end on the end. And this would be the C terminus, you know, the N terminus would be over here. And so when the, let's say when you digest or you eat food and you need to digest it, trypsinogen's waiting to get activated. You just cleave off this C terminus end here, and then it becomes trypsin, which is the active, the active enzyme form. And so the purpose of this is that you have these enzymes that are sitting there, they're ready to go and you just have this one last step where you cleave this off and they can be activated and carry out their function. So that's an example of trimming. The other is covalent bonding. Big example of this is phosphorylation. We'll talk about other examples on the next slide. So you have covalent modifications to proteins after they've been synthesized. And both these types of modifications can occur in the rough ER, they can occur in the Golgi apparatus, and they can also occur in the cytosol. And they serve many, many different functions. They can be part of signaling pathways, activation of the protein, cell surface recognition. This is important for the immune cell. So you have cells and you have these proteins on the surface and you know you have immune cells like this that are coming around and check basically essentially checking cells. And so they signal to the cell to the immune cells that they're normal and don't need to be destroyed. And so as you can see these modifications even though they're not part of translation they still serve major functions for proteins. So some examples, you have glycosylation. So this is adding carbohydrates, glycosyl. It's in the name. This is important for the ABO uh, blood groups. 
Now this is a complex concept, so we're not gonna get into too much detail, but just so you can kind of understand. So this is an RBC and it has sort of this structure like this. And they have these proteins embedded in the membrane and then they get glycosylated. You know, they have different types of sugars put on them. And this is how you distinguish, you know, A type from B type, from AB type, from O type. And so as you can see, it's very important for uh, recognition again by the immune system and ensuring that you know the proper blood type is given. Phosphorylation, this is a very high yield one, especially in biochemistry. Activation of enzymes, we're gonna talk a lot about this in unit three in the metabolism lecture, very heavily involved in metabolic pathways. Hydroxylation, so adding hydroxyl groups. Um, so adding, you know, this is really involved in collagen synthesis. Phosphorylation, this is carried out by Got to mention by kinases, which are proteins that add uh, phosphate groups. So you have a protein like this, phosphate group gets added in, and you have a phosphate like that. And then proteolytic cleavage, which is cleaving off a protein, cleaving off portions of the protein structure to result in usually enzyme activation, or they can also be part of such as the synthesis process, if, such as insulin synthesis. So the initial insulin structure is like this, so you have two portions of it, two sections, and then you have this third section here, which is called the C-peptide. And we'll go into more detail about the relevance of C-peptide in the unit six when we talk about diabetes, but this is actually cleaved off during synthesis to then yield the final insulin product. And then you have C-peptide over here which is in the bloodstream. And C-peptide, as we'll talk about, is actually measured sometimes in the blood to help with diagnosis of different diseases. And then briefly here, we'll talk about protein degradation. Mainly, we'll talk about tagging proteins with covalently bonded ubiquitin, which is a process called ubiquitination. So you have a protein here, goes throughout its life, and then ends up becoming damaged, or it's just kind of run its course, just like anything else. Proteins are like anything else. Eventually, you need to get new ones. And so let's say it's kind of damaged like this, it's lost its shape, it gets tagged with ubiquitin, like this. And then you have what's called the proteasome, which is this guy right here. And this is a multi-subunit protein complex. And this essentially it recognizes ubiquitinated proteins and then helps mediate the degradation of those proteins. Now where this can be important is actually in cancer because you can have molecular drivers of cancer. So let's say you have what's called an oncoprotein, which is a mutated protein driving cancer. So say for example, it can't undergo ubiquitination. It doesn't get these ubiquitin tags. Proteasome then can't recognize it. So then it just keeps carrying out its function. It never gets degraded. And as you can see, that's a problem. If any protein needs to be degraded, it's a protein causing cancer. And it just speaks to the fact of how complex cancer is. You know, as we've talked about, it's definitely involved at the genetic level where, you know, in the gene expression level that's and with uh, mutations at the DNA level. But it's also on the back end here with processes that are occurring within the cell itself. And this is an example of it where on the, even on the back end where you're supposed to be degrading proteins. So we're gonna finish this lecture out with a clinical pearl, sickle cell anemia. This is very high yield for biochem exams. It also comes up in pathology, physiology. Uh, you're gonna see it on med school exams. This particular concept we're gonna talk about here is almost guaranteed to show up on a biochem exam and it's likely you'll see something on a board exam too. So sickle cell anemia is a disease characterized by sickle-shaped red blood cells. So like this right here, almost kind of banana shaped. It's caused by a missense mutation in the beta glob globin gene, which is part of the hemoglobin structure. And this results in substituting a valine for a glutamic acid. So you see that here specifically. So here's the normal, hemoglobin A is normal. And then HBS refers to hemoglobin in individuals with sickle cell anemia. And so you have this substitution. This is a missense mutation, which you remember is a you know, a point mutation where you have, where you have substitution of a nucleotide, you have a new codon, and then you have a new amino acid. And that, in this case, you substitute valine in for glutamic acid. So now you have a different polypeptide sequence, and you've also altered the primary structure of the protein.
However, under normal physiological conditions, this usually does not affect the secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structure of hemoglobin. That's important to remember. And real quick, here's a peripheral blood smear of a patient with sickle cell anemia. So here's some of those sickle cell red blood cells here and here, and you can see that here. Now, when these patients encounter low oxygen levels, that's when they start to develop problems and symptoms because the sickle hemoglobin stick together, this HBS, into a stacked formation, which is called sickling, and this damages the RBC's membrane and decreases its elasticity. So normally, red, red blood cells, they have this nice biconcave shape like this, and red blood cells are essentially bags of hemoglobin. And so you have hemoglobin A, which would be the normal hemoglobin, you know, floating in throughout here. And what's nice is that they have this biconcave shape, which for when they pass through narrow blood vessels, such as capillaries, the red blood cell is able to fold like this. And so that helps it shoot through this narrow capillary and then out into the venous system where it can then resume its normal shape and flow through those larger veins. And so this elasticity is really important because it helps it pass through the capillaries, which is actually the main site of dumping off oxygen. And then also, it keeps them from getting stuck and occluding blood flow. So when these patients encounter low O2, these hemoglobin S's, they end up stacking like this. And so what that leads to is then you have this sickle shape that results in the red blood cells because of these stacked hemoglobin S's from this sickling, and this decreases the elasticity of the red blood cell. And so it's unable to bend and flex and pass through these capillaries really easily. And so when oxygen levels return to normal, these affected RBCs, these sickled red blood cells, they do not return to normal shape. So this is a permanent effect, and they remain rigid and unable to flex through and passing through narrow blood vessels. So what happens is, so if you have another narrow, is they end up getting stuck like this. And that's where you get problems, that's where you get occlusion of flow, and you get symptoms and ischemia. And the other thing is that as a result of these sickled red blood cells, these patients develop anemia, hence the name sickle cell anemia. And this results from destruction of these damaged red blood cells. So on top of all these vessel occlusion, they also have to deal with having a low red blood cell count. All right, so that wraps up our third and last lecture for Chapter 4. We've covered protein function, protein structure, protein synthesis, and then protein modifications and protein degradation.